Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God selected as the basis of our message comes from John chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Jesus said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now it became wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is God's word, you may be seen. When God created the heavens and the earth, everything he made was good. Nothing was not good, except one thing. When God had made Adam, he looked around and he says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper, suitable for him. So God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and took from his side one of his ribs. And from the rib, he fashioned a woman. And then he brought her to the man and presented her to the man. And the man said, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that's what the, the prefix woe here means. Not W-O-E, but W-O meaning out of. God himself knew that the human that he created, the soul that he made, needed fellowship, companionship, oneness, a sense of belonging to something greater than the individual. And this knowledge of God caused him to institute marriage. And through marriage, he intended to bring every blessing to us. Now, we could say, and it's true, that all of the pain, sadness, sorrow, suffering, heartache, grief, and woe that's in this world, you take the sum total of all of the sorrow that's in the world and you can sum it all up in, in one word. Separated. Separated in the sense of being alienated. No longer one. That's what happened when Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They made aprons of fig leaves. And when they heard the Son of God in the top garden, they hid from Him. In other words, before they had always been drawn to the Lord in communion and fellowship, oneness with God, and with sin now in the world, they were fleeing from Him, separating themselves from God. That communion and that oneness had been broken by their sin. And it is sin still today that brings continual brokenness and separation and isolation into our lives. Now we can be separated by illness. A loved one can be hauled out of the hospital or the nursing home. We can be separated from a loved one by death. Sometimes the military separates husbands and wives and they have to live apart from one another. Today in this economy, sometimes husbands and wives actually can't live together in the same house. One has to go traveling to a far different place, a different state, simply to earn a living, while the family is back here in Michigan. Separation is a sorrow. It's a sadness. We grieve it. There are other things that can cause separation, though. Not just sickness and death, not just the military, not just the economy, 
but all manner of sin. How many marriages have failed and caused and brought with them that failure of separation and alienation because of sin? How many friends have you lost over the years? People that you love because of sin. Sin causes this great divorce between God and man and between man and himself. That's why Jesus chose the wedding at Cana as his inaugural miracle for the beginning of his entire worship, for the beginning of his entire ministry. He could have healed the leper, he could have made whole the lame, opened the eyes of the blind, he could have done any number of miracles, but he chose to make the water into wine as his inaugural miracle, to start out his entire ministry, to show to you and to me what God was doing in Christ. What was God doing in Christ? He was bringing back together again that which had been broken. And he wasn't bringing it back in anything less than its perfect form. Ephesians teaches us that God's plan for the fullness of time is a great wedding feast. God's plan for the fullness of time is to unite all things together in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. The very definition of marriage is, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. And what God has joined together, let not man separate. This Savior of ours comes to us, not a virginal perfect bride, but he comes into this world and he finds his bride imprisoned and chained in death, in rebellion, in addiction. Not clean and pure, but violated and sullied. And he says, this is my bride. And he understands that the only way that this bride of his can be rescued from the chains of death, from the prison of damnation, the only way his bride can be healed of her diseases and of her addictions, the only way his bride can be made beautiful again, virginal and perfect, is if he comes into this world and becomes her sin. He comes into this world, he who knew no sin, Scripture says, became sin for us. And he said, set her free, set my bride free. I will pay the price for her crimes. I will suffer the punishment for her wrongdoing. As we see Christ upon the cross, we see the bride price being made right there. A custom in many cultures, bride price, you know. What, she's worth something, you know. What are you going to give me for my daughter? I'll give you two doggies and a squirrel. I don't know. What is the bride price for the church? Holy, innocent blood and suffering and death. That's the cost for Christ to rescue his bride. So, in the wedding at Cana, we have a human husband, a human groom, and a human bride we have this wedding feast going on. It must have been relatively well organized because there was a steward. Now a steward is somebody that you hire to manage the wedding.